Inclusion. Inclusion podcast by the Centre for Inclusive Leadership. Well, welcome to our latest episode of Inclusion Podcast. I am so excited that I have my dear friend Paolo Hewitt with me today. Paolo, thank you for being with us. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Good stuff. Well, we're going to, you'll be pleased to know we're not going to have to talk about our other love. So we're going to, <laughs> <laughs> I won't do that to you. Okay. <laughs> we can put that to the side. Yeah. But Paolo, it's fantastic to have you with us. Uh, you're, of course, very, very well known, critically acclaimed for your work and some of the writing you've done, the books you've written about amazing artists, whether it be Bowie or whether it be The Jam or whether it be Paul Weller or Oasis. You've done some absolutely extraordinary work. Thank you. But it's your story I want to get into today. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the fact that you've written so much about other artists, but I want to talk about you. Yeah. And particularly, I want to talk about the book that really connected you and I together, mm-hmm. which is this wonderful book here called But We All Shine On. So I should show this to the camera because yes, people you need should. To rush out and buy yeah. this because it's a fantastic book. But this book is very, very profound to me. And it's profound to me because we have a connection in the story. Sure, course, sure. Right? Which yeah, is yeah. how we met. Yeah. And um, I want to get into talking about We All Shine On. Mm-hmm. I want to talk a little bit about your memory, because this is about your time in a children's home called yeah. Burbank, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but I wonder if you might just, what's your recollection of how we connected? Because it, it, the story's sitting in here, isn't it? Well, like so much things, like so many things in my life, it goes back to the to Burbank, to the children's home. Mm. Um, uh, when I was twelve years old, nineteen seventy, uh, a, a, a fourteen year old meteor called Des Hurrian arrived at <laughs> uh, Burbank Children's Home, and um, uh, I was very much into music, books, and football, and he was very much into music, books, and football, so we bonded really quickly. To be honest with you, I was very kind of starstruck by Des. He was, um, he seemed more, he seemed more, what's the word, older than his years. And um, I discovered that he'd kind of, when he came into the care system, he'd adopted this persona. You see, he, because he was quite sensitive, he knew that he would have to defend himself in the children's home. So he adopted this persona, which was basically... I can't fight, so if I can't fight, I'm going to make you laugh before you hit me, you see. So if you're laughing, you're not going to hit me. <laughs> so he was very wise, cracky, and he had all these kind of things going on. And um, anyway, I, I, we became very firm friends, um, and then he left about four years later, 76, I think it was, and I went and did what I had to do, and he did what he had to do. And then we, they, they, the BBC did a documentary about me when I had a book called The Looked After Kid Come Out. Mm-hmm. And they tracked him down and I, I hadn't seen him in years and it was great to see him and we kind of reconnected. Unfortunately, he, um, he had a fondness for alcohol and that, uh, that led to his early demise. Um, and uh, I went to his funeral down in Guildford and that there you were doing the uh, doing the ceremony because mm. you Des had been your brother. You'd been in a foster family with him, hadn't you? <laughs> Sorry. And I, I had no idea. And um, and that's where we met. It's extraordinary, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. And then I found out that a you loved Tottenham Hotspur and b you'd lived in Crouch End. I was like, hang on a sec. I love Tottenham Hotspur and I live in Crouch End. <laughs> Are we not friends? <laughs> yeah. What's going on here? Yeah. It was really extraordinary. Oh, and your love of music as well, I love which music. which yeah, 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 yeah. I love music. Yeah. And it was really interesting. But unlike Des, I can actually play football, which I <laughs> <laughs> just not being unkind. But it's it was a fascinating because Des had spoken to me about you a number of times. And I remember in the because I hadn't seen him. I let he and I. When he left, gosh, when our foster parents, well, they were my, it was my foster parents yeah. and his adopted parents. Yeah. When they finally died, that would have been the, third, the second that the, the mother died, um, that would have been 1969. And in 69, what happened is we, went, we left Adelstone, which is where we were, in a okay. little place just yeah, outside yeah. Chertsey. Um, and we went into another foster home yeah. in uh, Kenton in Harrow. Okay. But it was all kind of decided, it was predetermined that Des's future was kind of mapped out for him. And it was actually quite an interesting story because he was the adopted child. Yeah. And I was the foster child. Yeah. And our trajectories were going to be very different. Yeah. And he essentially had been his, my foster mother, his adopted mother, it gets so confusing. Um, she had essentially, they'd made provision for Des. And so he went to somewhere in Nottingham, I think. He to went school. to a public, went public to, school in Public Nottingham. school in Nottingham. Yeah, which added to his allure to me. It's he was also, he played the guitar. He introduced me to bands like Steely Dan, who, you know, I was like, what the? 
Yeah, yeah. That, no, that's not. A, that's not a bad favour to do. Someone introduced yeah, me to Steely Dan. Is yeah, it? Des introduced me to Steely Dan. He introduced me to Lindisfarne. Um, uh, the thing about Des was, I, 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 I had little confidence, no confidence. You know, I was very insecure, no confidence. And Des seemed to have all this. You know, he, we'd be having breakfast, and I'd say, uh, he'd go, um, "Oh yeah, I've been asked to write the school play." And I just said, oh, God, that's the most glamorous thing. I've... Somebody's asked you to write a school play. I mean, I don't think they had. I think it was all that, you know, but it just added to it, you know. Yeah. Or he'd say, you know, oh, God, did you see the Sweeney last night? Yeah, I think I should write an episode of that. You know, like just that kind of, you know, that kind of thinking. And uh, so he was very much, um, you know, someone that, he was two years older than me as well. So he was, very, I mean, as I always say, if you'd have come to Burbank Children's Home in 1974, 75, and got us all lined up and said, who's the one who's going to succeed? You'd have probably gone for Des. Do you know what I mean? Because he had it all. Or he seemed to, he have, seemed it to have it all. But he didn't have it all. But it's self in the case, right? It's yeah. The case. I mean, it was, so what happened was, uh, when I was just a little boy. No. <laughs> when I was um, about 40, 41, I wrote my memoir, The Looked After Kids. Yeah. Right? And... Um, when that came out, uh, the internet was really starting to kind of become a reality in our lives. And there was a thing called Friends Reunited. Oh, I remember, yeah, yeah. And a lot of people came to me from Burbank. Through, I read your book, da di da di da bang, bang, bang. And one day I thought, what happened to them? You know, what happened to all these, you know, what happened to Des, what happened to Norman, what happened to Fred, you know, blah, blah, blah. So then I reconnected with Des and... Um, it was very sad. He told me that he had had this, that when he was 12 and he went into care, he realised that to deal with care, he would have to put on this persona, as I said. Mm. And so he became a different person. He wasn't himself. And he carried that all the way through until he was 27 and had a massive breakdown. He was working for Penguin Books, I believe, doing that, IT. And he just had a massive breakdown. And... Um, took years and years of therapy to kind of get him back on the ground, but I don't think he ever really did because what happened was his, his real mum was Irish and she had abandoned him because she'd had him out of wedlock, which you don't do in Ireland. So she'd come to England, put him in a baby home in Highgate, mm. which ironically was just down the yeah, road from where I live. Yeah. Um, and then he'd been fostered by your... The your Hurians, yeah. Yeah, your lot. And, um, and then uh, she turned up with her boyfriend. So he had two mums, Right. And then one day, she, and he was like, okay. And then one day, the, the Irish mother turns up and says, oh, by the way, I'm off to America. I've got, I've got a new man, and bang. And, off, and he said, he traced it back, and he said, if only my foster mother, foster mother, adopted mother, had, had, adopted mother, had yeah. hugged me, had comforted me, had told me, I'm your mother, I'm going to be all right. But they were kind of like, oh, don't worry about it. And it was a huge blow to him, and I don't think he ever recovered from it, you know. So interesting, you know, because I have a real, really distinct recollection of that night because I remember that night very well. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, I remember that night. In fact, I wrote about it in one of my books because okay. it, was, it was such a turning point for me and my understanding of, like, just about everything. Yeah. Because what had happened, and, and Des, as you, as you know, went off to Nottingham, as you say, but yeah. when he, so I last saw him, yeah. this is the scary bit, I last saw him when I was 10, right? So I met him, last time I met him, saw him was in 1970. Yeah. And then... When I met him, when I met him again in Woking, when did he die? How many years ago were we talking about? Five. Five? Awesome. So literally there's like a 45-year yeah. hiatus. Yeah. And then when I met him, I was like, um, uh, I don't quite know what to do about this. That was just extraordinary. And we got another friend, Henry Nile, who was yeah, the mix yeah, up that yeah, triangle, who, yeah. was the, who really helped me to make sense of it. But that night was fascinating because what had happened was the house had settled down. There was a knock on the door. And um, this, this woman had arrived with this guy, and she was talking to who I thought was my mother, by the way, um, talking to my mother at the front door. My mother was having an argument with this woman. Anyway, she shoes her off. She goes away, and the next day, and we're talking about Desmond, and uh, who, funny, you always call him Des, don't you? That's so weird, because I always call him Desmond, which is a bit weird. Anyway, so we, we went, we, so when the next morning we got up for breakfast, and we were sitting around the breakfast table. There was myself, Des, and uh, my mother, and um, I wanted to know what was going on. So I was kicking Des as well. I said, well, go on. And um, so eventually he said, uh, what happened last night? And our mother said, um, very gravely, she goes, 
Well, she says, Desmond, or Desi, she swims. Well, Desi, she says, uh, your mother came to collect you last night, but I told her to go away. And I, I was like, what? S sorry, do that again. <laughs> your mother, I, I'm so completely confused. Um, he got really upset, stormed out of the dining room where we, were, where we had or breakfast, mm. where it was, him stamping up the stairs to the bedroom, slammed the door, didn't come back out. So I'm sitting in this very awkward moment with my mother, mm. and the really weird part of it was, Paolo, the really messed up part of it was, I had this kind of empathy towards my mother, and I thought, I'm like nine, I thought, but I'm gonna reach out and help her in this moment, because I can see this is a bad moment for her. So I said to her, it's all right, mum, don't worry. And she just burst into tears, mm. and I'm like, oh, um, and she said to me, <laughs> I'm just glad it wasn't your mum, because if it was your mum, I would have had to give you back. <laughs> and I went, what? And she God. said, yeah, you see, Desmond's adopted. He's my child. He's legally my child. You're just adopted. Is you're that just when you fostered. found out? Yeah, you're oh just fostered. God. And I'm like, I was kind of trying to help you, and now you've thrown this at me. And from that moment, I had this kind of, there was this real schism between myself and Des, because I just thought, I'm yeah, so yeah. completely. He's the golden boy. He's I'm the golden the, boy, right? Yeah. I'm like just I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know what it was. And we had a sister, and we have a sister as well. And it wouldn't be right for me to tell her story, but she has a different lens on this as well. And um, so when our mother, the woman who was paid to look after me, or whatever, you know, it was so confusing. When she passed away before she died, she brought us to Guildford Hospital. Now, bear in mind, the next time I was in Guildford Hospital was 46 years later when Des was about to die. Yeah, yeah. So I don't have a good relationship with that hospital, and. Um, she said to me, she sat Des down and she had a long conversation with him. She told him all these provisions been made. They've made all the provision in the will. He was doing this, he was doing that. He was going off to Nottingham, he's going to private school. Everything's been catered for. And he came back and he said, mum wants to see you, right? And I said, what's happening? And he said, what I just told you. And I went, oh, okay. And I honestly, this was, I, I feel almost uncomfortable telling you this, but we're friends. I walked towards my mother's bed thinking, do you know what? If Desi's going to be sorted out that way, Ren, I'm going to be fine because let me tell you something, he is the laziest person on the face of the earth. He's mm. always getting told off. I'd even been given his pocket money because I used to do all the work, right? right? So I thought, this is going to work out great. Yeah. So um, <laughs> when my mother said to me, she said, uh, she sat me down and she said, Paul, I don't know how long I've got to live and all the rest. She went through this whole thing and she goes, but arrangements have been made for you. She goes, you're going to an orphanage. Everything's going to be fine. Oh. And I was like, my only concepts of an orphanage was like Oliver. That's the same as mine. You're same, right? Yeah. And you thought, and I was thinking Fagan, yeah, I was thinking yeah. Bill Sykes. I was like, I was freaking out thinking, yeah. what? Yeah, yeah. And of course, the next thing you know, you show up in this orphanage yeah. and there it is. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about that, the orphanage experience, Paolo, because for me, I, I wanted to talk about if we can tie this a bit to the whole inclusion conversation. Sure. Because for me, inclusion is about belonging. Yeah. And one of the things that really strikes me and really resonates for me as a as a looked after, you use, I love the way you use the phrase looked after kid. I always just say orphan, right? Because I, I think there's something that's- I use it ironically. Yeah, well, I know you do. And I think that's kind of interesting because to me, it's got a real thud to it. But talk to me, if you wouldn't mind, about what happened to you in terms of acceptance and your sense of identity and how you find yourself as you kind of wake up in a world where you know that your parents didn't want you or couldn't look after you, I don't yeah, you know, look whatever after you want to say. Yeah, I mean, yeah. mum is slightly more <laughs> problematic, <laughs> but you just couldn't look after you, let's do that. Um, what do you do with that? I think it's only in later life that I've, that I've, um, I think when I was a child growing up in that, it was about getting through it and it was about Finding a, I, I, I was very lucky because when I was fourteen, I read the enemy and I thought that's what I'm going to do in life. You're going to be a writer. I'm going to be a writer, and that is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to put everything I've got into doing that. So that became my focus, you see, and I was very lucky because a lot of the other kids I was with didn't have that kind of sure. focus. Care system at my time was pretty cruel. They'd throw you out at sixteen if mm. you if you if you didn't stay on at school. Same with me, yeah, exactly. Right. Same. Which so, is the only reason I stayed on at school because I would yeah. could, I couldn't bear the idea of going into the world. I was well, terrified. yeah, the sixteen-year-old. I mean, I, oh, I, I right. So I knew 
so just in practical terms, right? How to open a bank account, how to put a shelf up, how to cook a meal. I had none of that. None of us did because it was all done for us. Of course. So to throw people out into the into horrible little one bedroom rooms in Woking, which is what a lot of them mm. ended up, at sixteen, you know, it was just ridiculous, you know, it was cruel, it was really cool. But I was lucky because I had this thing. So my thing was that's where I'm going. To the enemy. I'm going to the enemy. Why the enemy? Because it, 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 I was just obsessed with it when I was a kid. Where, where I was, when I first read it in 1972 or something, it was music and words. Yeah. It, it was books and, I mean, books and music took me out of, I was with a foster mother who made, I don't know, made Vladimir Putin look like a good deal. Do you know Seriously. what I mean? I don't want to be, you know, facetious. But it was, it she wasn't was, She was six, it was, I had the, one of the worst childhoods, right? It what was, happened? Locked in cupboards, caned, and but it wasn't really the physical abuse; it was the psychological. Look at you, you're so ugly. Look at you, how dare you? You're thick, you are. You know, it's constant. Mm. You know, therefore no confidence when Des arrives. You know, insecure. Uh, yeah, of course. You know all that. Um, so, um, in the children's home, for the first time in my life, there was a gang, and they were older kids, and. I got into that gang, and for the first time in my life, I was accepted. You belong somewhere. I belong somewhere. Yeah. I belong to this Colin Nolly, Big Tommy, Jimmy Big Boyle. Tommy, I love it. Big, Big Tommy, Tommy, Jimmy <laughs> Boiler, down the boiler room, smoking ciggies, blah, you know, going into Woking, oh, it's still, you know, anyway, blah, blah, blah. But I was in a gang, and, it, and I felt great, you know, I was accepted. <clears throat> but one of the worst things that happens in a children's home is that you make relationships and you think, oh, I'm really good friends with so-and-so. And then you come home from school, where's so-and-so? Oh, they've left, they've gone now. You know? yeah. And that, that's what happened to the gang, a lot of them left, you know. We used to have a saying in our orphanage where they used to say, they used to call the, refer to the boys, but they've disappeared. So disappeared. they would be disappeared. So wow. you'd go, you'd come home, exactly oh what God. you said. Yeah. You're, Big mate, and then yeah. you come home, and they, we, they, the kids you said they disappeared him. Yeah, we, it was we, like, yeah. it's just gone. It's like a kick, wasn't it? Yeah, just gone. Kick in the just stomach. Gone. It was like horrible that. And members of staff, there might be a couple of members of staff that yeah. I got close to, and was getting a sort of fathery thing, and then gone. They disappeared. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about your. What did you? So you. So you. You, you focus on going to the enemy. The yeah, New yeah. Musical Express. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Take the train to the big city. Yeah. You go to London. Tell yeah. me about that. How did you? How did you find your idea? Because I'm curious that you've done so much work about writing about other people, which is fascinating to me. Well, that was one of the things I discovered about interviewing. I didn't have to talk about myself. <laughs> you know, so I'm just, I'm asking you about you. Yeah. And I do it all the time now. I can tell you a bit more about myself because I've written books about it. But it's still, do you still have to coax it from you? I always, I always like to find out about others. I'm always fascinated by other people's lives anyway. Do you know what I mean? Because I can use them <laughs> And use it in scripts and stuff <laughs> later on. That's part of it. But I've, I've always been interested in others. Um, when I, I used to go to London to us in Woking, right, which is like 30 miles outside of London, was like the shimmering city. That's where it was. Yeah. You know, it was like, it was like New York, oh, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> oh, I just want to get there. And it was funny because Woking used to kind of, sometimes it used to think itself part of London, but it wasn't that. Right. Woking is Woking. And um, I knew I had to get to London, so I, I got into a college there. And when I got to London, I told myself that I would never tell anybody about my past, right? My past, for two reasons. One, it was really raw, and I had my back to it, and I'm not going to look back at Burbank or what had gone on. My mother, my foster mother, I'm not going to look, I'm going to look there. Second of all, I'm not going to tell anybody about this because... I want to know if I can make it as a writer. Oh, And I don't want sympathy. I don't want someone to go, oh, yeah, we'll give you... He's, he's a children, so. You get an orphan discount, don't you? Yeah, you get an orphan discount. Yeah. No, you, I know. I, you I, know that one? Of course, I've used... I've, I've had yeah. an orphan discount all yeah. my life. <laughs> I used to... The only time I used it was at school, right? So if I'm getting told off by a teacher, Paolo, you and Dad, and I, yeah, but missing the children's home... Uh, uh, oh, oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'd use it for that. You get some bag. clemency. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean? But I wouldn't. I didn't tell anybody. I mean, I probably 
Well, I arrived in London in 78 and the Looked After Kid came out in 2000, 2001. So mm. 78, 88, 22 years, maybe told three people, right? Wow. So I never, t and then, in fact, there were friends of mine, George and Jenny, and I'd known them 13 years and was very close to them. When the book came out, they were like, what? What about partners? What about girlfriends? And stuff? No. I didn't have that many long-term relationships because I had big problems with intimacy. Well, amazing. And I, so I, amazing had, I had low, really low self-esteem. So if I met a girl and she really liked me, I'd think, well, you've got to be... It's, I mean, it's really effed up way oh, of thinking. Listen, Paolo, don't. That one. You know that one? Oh, if you like me, then you've got to be even worse than me because I'm terrible. I remember, you know what, it's funny, I remember when I was, I would have been about 15, I suppose, Yeah. and I, I had a job in Wood Green. It was like, it was a coming of age job. It was right. so exciting because I was in a, in Enfield, as you know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I sort of just discovered that I was mixed race, which was a yeah. whole nother conversation. Yeah. And suddenly I was in Wood Green and yeah. I was all amongst these, all this Caribbean community yeah, and it yeah, was amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I was working in Tesco's in Wood Green, right, which is now I think the McDonald's or something. Oh, right. And, right, right. Uh, I know it. No, you know where I'm talking I'm, I'm, I live there, <laughs> Yeah, of course you do. Yeah. And I remember this girl asked me once if I'd come to, if I'd like to come to her house for Christmas dinner. Yeah. This really beautiful, lovely young black woman, she said to me, would you like to come to dinner? I'd like to have you home for Christmas dinner. And I stood there and I laughed at her. You laughed at her? I just laughed. Why? I just, because I didn't understand what that even meant. I didn't know what to do. I was like, I, oh, didn't, I just doctor. felt so awkward and so like, why would you want to do that? Yeah. And she was mortified, yeah, this yeah. poor girl. Oh, yeah. And I thought, oh, no. I, and I can't kind of take it back. Did you I, tell people about your past? Yeah, I, I did, but I don't. I, I often have. I've done that a lot, and more more recently, I think. Yeah. Um, I feel like now, to an extent, I don't know if I never ever fully have managed to outrun the orphan shadow. I'm not sure. If no, I've you don't. You never do. It's, it's, you it, never do. It for me, it recedes. I look back now at my life, and I look back to there with the foster mother, and I think, oh, that poor little kid getting locked in the cupboard. Yeah. And I look back to Burbank, and I look back at Burbank in a really positive light. Because I learnt so much there, you know. I learnt, I especially learnt about loyalty and about friendship. All of us kids there together were bound to each other. They were my brothers and sisters. I mean, there were 25 of the little yeah, yeah. of them. Children. Children. <laughs> but we were all brothers and sisters. And there's a fascinating book in Arthur Miller, you know, the playwright's biography, and he talks about when he was with Marilyn Monroe. And he said, we used to go to, you know, gatherings or parties or whatever. And she used to stand there and she'd go, that guy there, he was in the children's zone. And I thought, oh my God, it's that psychic. You, uh, you know. Yeah, you it's a psychic thing. Yeah. And she knew. Yeah. He, she said it was something to do with the eyes. She could see something in the eyes of people. But that, so that gave me loyalty and uh, friendship, resilience, you know. And I just thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to go to London and I'm going to find out if I'm a good writer or not. If I'm not, fine, I'll go back to Woking and I'll get the job in the insurance office or the whatever I'm going to do. Do you know what I mean? Blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to go to London and I'm not going to tell anyone. And, you know, I, uh, I got into a college there and I started it all there and that's where it all began. But I had the strength to do it because of Burbank and because of my mother as well. That's so interesting because, mm. and I've not talked to you about that before, but to me that's so fascinating because I did the reverse of that, you know, which is interesting. Oh. First and foremost, I think when I arrived in the orphanage, I didn't get it. <laughs> I just didn't. Oh God, you don't. I just you, didn't you're get it. Out. It's yeah, like it's what? weird. Yeah, I know. I, I, don't know. I don't understand. I know. Yeah. And I think for me, what was interesting, as I reflect on it, is the children that were in the home. Most of the, they were they were like we would call Joeys, or people that came to Joeys. And a Joey was someone that was literally a native. They were completely institutionalised. I would had 10 years with dads and a foster family yeah. with middle class aspirations and all the rest of it. Yeah. And I arrived in this place, what the hell are these people doing? I just, it was like being, you know, uh, what's his name in the Shawshank Redemption? It, Andy yeah. Dufresne. It was yeah. like, oh, I don't understand. Yeah. But then I kind of, then you find your rhythm you, yeah. and you and you, and yeah. you kind of get into it. But what was interesting was my dream as a young person when I was about 15, 16, my absolute dream was I wanted to be a barrister. Okay. Do you remember Crown Court? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're showing it at the moment. No talking, way. I, really, I used TV. to watch that 
all the time religiously. I, I, if I was either going to be a footballer or a barrister, I wasn't. I was. <laughs> I wasn't good enough to be either. But I remember going to my um, uh, counselor in the Jesuit college I was at school at, and um, saying this is what I wanted to do, and they looked at me and went, "You're probably going to be better off working in a shop." Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and then yeah. I went home back to the orphanage and I talked to one of the nuns. And they went, "I want to be a barrister," but the teacher said I'd probably be better off in a shop. And they went, "I think you would be better in a shop." And I thought, I oh, maybe I would be better in the shop. And I kind of slumped into that, so I didn't have that. You know, I wish they wrote at Tesco's in wood cream. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But I think what's interesting to me is I don't know, and I like that Marilyn Monroe point because I'm not sure, Paolo, because I can tell you an orphan from a thousand miles away. You could do the same as Marilyn. Hundred wow. percent. I can tell you from a thousand miles wow, away wow, if you were wow, in wow. care, wow. because I'm not sure about whether, certainly for me, whether I managed to fully out outrun that orphan shadow. No, you never do. There's something about it's it. Always isn't it? It's always there. It's always there. It's always. There. I say it, not this one. The looked after yeah. It's always at the back of your mind. It's always there. It's, it, but it's what you do with it. Is the important thing. It's what you do with it. One of the things that I learned in the children's home, being pertinent to why we're here. Is inclusion. That's interesting. Tell me more about that. Well, because because we had this psychic thing going on, wherever you came from, whoever you were, it didn't matter. We had two very upper class brother and sister at the at the children's home, who normally at say at, um, at my school would have been ripped apart. But in the children's home, they were safe because it's there was acceptance. Absolutely, right? we we accepted them because it was like. Well, something be- What's interesting is we never spoke about why we were there. We never ever sat down and went, why are you here? Oh, do who are you? None of that. So I just looked at them and thought, well, something bad has happened to them. And they're looking at me and saying, something bad has happened to you. And that brought us all together. So it didn't matter what part of the world you were from or what class or... As long as you weren't an Arsenal fan, you were... Well, right. obviously not. <laughs> obviously not. There's a special place for them. Yeah. <laughs> special orphanage. <laughs> That's there. right. It's called the Emirates. <laughs> the Emirates. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's interesting because in our, in our orphanage, it was not dissimilar to that. Yeah. What, we, what we would know is that we, were all, we all had this in common. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, that's what I mean. Nobody and knows. that's why you can spot them. Yeah, and that's why I can spot them. Yeah. And our thing, the thing I think the common denominator for me was, the thing we have in common is the people that were supposed to love us don't love us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And because of yeah, that, or exactly. can't love us. Yeah, yeah. And because of that, I think that sets you on a particular yeah. trajectory. I found out, when I, when I did that book, I found out stuff about those kids. Stephen, there was a long drive. And Stephen Broadbury, six years old, used to stand at the end of the drive every morning because down the hill would come a bus with his mother on, who was a bus conductress. Mm-hmm. And he would stand there and he would wave to her and she would look away. And do you know why she looked away? Because she'd given him into care because she had a boyfriend and the boyfriend didn't like him to get rid. Terrible. I mean, that cruelty that went on in the 70s and 80s, I think is better now. I think there's much more awareness now and I think there's much more... Inclusion, in fact, in some ways, you know, around the care thing. I've, I've, I speak to people and I go to care things and I do readings and I find out that children's homes now, I was in a children's home. My children's home, there was 25 staff, no, 25, 25 kids, three staff. My children's mm-hmm. home now, three kids, 25 staff. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, so yeah. it's changed, there is change and um, <laughs> that's good. But you know what, I'm really glad I, I was. Brought up in one. It's, it's yeah. brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. It's brilliant. I mean, I think that I want to ask you one more question because I know, sure. I've, I know I've got to let you go, which yeah. is a shame because I'd like to chat all day. Yeah. Um, I think what drives me when I think about the inclusion work, though, is mm. that you talked about having your back at your back and you moving into the enemy into music. Yeah. I think what really I find interesting about inclusion, why it becomes missional for me, mm. is because inclusion is about belonging. Yeah. And I think because I have such, and you'll recognise this, because I have such a history rooted in exclusion, Yes. Yeah. that's a feeling yeah. I just don't want people to experience yeah. anywhere, in yeah, the workplace, yeah, in yeah, their relationship, yeah, anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Paolo, one last question, if I sure. may. You, you're the boy that came a long way from working, if I may say so. Thank you. When I think, when many books have you written? 22, 23? 20, 24, sir. Oh, that's right, there's a new one, 24. Oh, Excuse 24. Me. I, beg your, I, beg, I beg your pardon. 24 books and a season ticket holder at Tottenham Hotspur. There you go. <laughs> Let me ask you something. You met some amazing people. I know you've interviewed uh, Stevie Wonder. Yeah. You've written books on the jam. You've blah, done blah, blah. Bowie and goes on and on and on. What have you learned? Don't give up. Whatever your dream is, don't give up. Keep going. Done about what it takes. Keep going. If you've got that, if you think that's what I want, you just you you go like that. 
and you keep going, whatever the world throws at you, whatever it does, whether it puts you on your back 10 times a day, get up and keep going. And one day you knock on the door and it opens. And David Bowie say, are you Paolo here? <laughs> yeah. Or actually you're like, okay, are you David Bowie? <laughs> I've, I've, got, I've got, there was a, I was, do you know Nick Lowe? He was a musician. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Is, is he is he is he a disco diva? Is he? No, you, you know, no, I've got yeah, a very limited yeah, palate. Come on, as soon as I said it, I help me out, help me out. But anyway, Nick Lowe, he produced Costello. He he was he was he's a very influential guy, and he's a lovely singer songwriter. And I went to see him, and my mate got me backstage, and we were backstage. And Nick Lowe walked in, and he saw my mate who he knew, and he said, "Oh, hello, Martin." And Martin said, "Oh, this is Paolo." And he went, "What, Paolo Hewitt? Oh, big fan of yours." Oh, I was wow. Like, wow, you know, I've just been watching him for two hours, you know, so, yeah, I, you know, but that's what I mean, I didn't give up, I just kept going and going, you know, that's what you got to do, you know. What a hopeful story, from the kid that was left locked in the cupboard, yeah, 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 to backstage with Nick Lowe saying, there you go, you're proud of him, I'm yeah, a big fan of yours. Exactly, exactly. You know the best one? Martin Chivers. So I did Martin Tell me a Chivers story and then we'll let you go, Martin go on. Chivers was my hero, my Spurs hero. Of course. Big poster of him on bedroom wall, right? Big chip. Big chip, right. I used to look at that poster, he had the ball, and I said, what's he doing with the ball? Is he passing it to Perryman? Is he about to shoot? You know, just daydreaming about chivers. I get to do what I do, and then one day my agent rings me and says, um, there's a guy called Martin Chivers, would you like to do his book? <laughs> I do his would you like to ghostwrite his book? You're a Spurs fan, aren't you? I'm like, wow. So, anyway. I used to meet Martin every Wednesday, he lived in Potter's Bar, and he would turn up in his car, and I'd get into his car, and he'd go, how are you? I'd go, yeah, all right, all right. I'd say, I'm in Martin Chivers car. You know, and then he'd make me a cup of coffee. Do you want a coffee? Yeah, why right, no sugar. Yeah. Making me a cup of coffee. You know, I was like that, you know. Anyway, one day he said to me, he used to play for Southampton before he uh, came yeah. to the Mecca, and uh, <laughs> he, uh, he said to me, would you like to come to Southampton for a game, and you can meet some of the old people I was with, and blah, blah. I said, great. So we meet him at Waterloo and we get the train and it stops at Woking, which is where the children's are. Oh. And I'm sitting there and he's talking away and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm sitting on a train with Martin Shivers and just down the road, 30 years ago, I was looking up at a poster of you thinking, God, what's he doing? Who's he passing to? Who's, you know, that was just, I couldn't tell him. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But it was for me, that one. <laughs> and what a name for a book. But we all shine on. The remarkable orphans of Burbank Children's Home. And you are one of them, my dear Thank friend. You. Thank you. What an time. absolute privilege. Absolute privilege. I'm sure people are going to want to get in touch with you and find out about your books and all the rest of it. I hope so they do. Can you give us a little advert? Where can they get you? I'm on Amazon. I only get a penny. <laughs> we will surely give people your details. Paolo, what a joy. Thank you so much. Thank you no, so much. It's great to talk to you as oh, well because I you. didn't know a lot about your background, you know, so it's good. I'm going to hammer you next time that uh, we meet for a meal, that's for sure. Uh, Show I me got, everything there. Yeah, we'll do our uh, Notting Hill Gate dinner with each other. Get Nile we'll off, get Nile off, let him have the Nile. Yeah. What a pleasure. Thank you. No thank you. Absolute thank pleasure. you. Paolo here. Brilliant.